If your brother or grandfather that beautiful music that you have given us. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> Praise God for giving us again another time together to worship him and of course to fellowship with each other. It's been a while that I haven't been back here in Apple Valley, all nations, considering that uh, I have to also comply some of my appointments that uh, I had at, uh, the in the Philippines during these um, graduation exercises in our colleges and in our academies there. You know, the month of March is the month of uh, graduation in our country. So that's the reason why I was out that month and also uh, of April. But anyway, we are here today and praise the Lord for bringing us uh, fully well. I'm sure there are some issues with some of us, but the Lord is still good. God is good all the time. And of course, before I forget, I'd like to just greet our mothers who are here today. Happy Mother's Day. Today, I think this weekend is Mother's Weekend, Mother's uh, Day weekend. And of course, without uh, this part of our family, I don't know what happened. So again, Happy Mother's Day and to all our grandmothers as well who are here today. But for you, of you who are still contemplating to become a mother, do it. Why not? Well, God, God told us to do it. So... Praise God. I'm sure it's a, it's a challenge, actually, to be a mother. But it's a gift. It's priceless. Uh, your children will testify to that once you are a mother. Three weeks ago, or I think two weeks ago, or I think three weeks ago, the Christian world memorialized or, say, celebrated what we call the Holy Week. Do you remember that? Well, in our country, we call it uh, Holy Thursday and Good Friday, and then you have the weekend, and then Sunday, which is Easter. I just want to give an emphasis on that part of Christ's experience, because uh, that was something that uh, I need to understand fully well, and I'm sure you need to understand as well, because... Not only did he minister here on earth, but he sacrificed himself because of you and me. He sacrificed himself. Now, our meditation today is based from the book of Matthew, chapter 27, 45 to 54. That's where we will base our meditation. But before opening the word of God, I'll ask each one of us to just bow our heads for prayer. Our Father God, thank you again for giving us your word. And as we open it, oh Father, I pray that this word of yours will bring honor and glory to your name and us to realize how great your love was for all of us and still is for all of us. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus was almost dead. That much was clear to everyone. He might have lived a few more minutes, but not much longer than that. Now, every tortured breed testified to the thorough job by the Roman soldiers. You know, the Roman soldiers are expert on, or they are expert at killing. They're experts at killing. It had all gone according to plan that day. This started with two criminals, and then the next one is Jesus. Nine o'clock came, nine o'clock in the morning. Nine o'clock came, and crucifixion time. Crucifixion time. There were hammers, there were nails, screams of pain, men stripped naked, and in fact, there was the smell of death in the air. Blood oozing and dripping, sweat rolling off the bodies. And there were people 
watching, talking, and laughing. If you are the king of the Jews, come down from the cross. For three hours, friends, for three hours, it was just like any other crucifixion. Now I'm bringing our minds to that day. I hope we can just throw back our time. We were not there, of course. We just see pictures or graphics about that experience. People shouting. Then there was high noon, 12 o'clock. And we did three hours of total darkness. When the high noon struck, or 12 o'clock struck, there was total darkness. Because there was total darkness, there was the sound of panic. There was the sound of panic. People shouting here and there, and then silence. Three hours passed, an eternity of darkness. At 3 p.m., what happened? The sun suddenly shines again. All eyes now focus on the man in the middle. All eyes were focused on the man in the middle. He looks terrible. He looks terrible. Something awful was or has happened to him during those three hours. His chest this time is now heaving. Heaving. The death rattle is in his throat. You can even hear it. The rattling of his throat signifying that death is almost to come. He speaks. Then he speaks again. And then again. And then one more time, almost in a whisper, he cries out. Then he is gone. He is gone. The other two men are still alive. But Jesus has died. It happened quickly. It happened suddenly. Almost as if he decided it was time to die. Now, friends, brothers and sisters, here's a fascinating note to consider. Listen. In describing the moment of his death, the gospel, uh, the gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these gospel writers didn't say that Jesus died. You don't say there, you cannot read it there, that these four writers say that Jesus or Christ died. What I mean is, they never use the phrase. They never use the phrase. Matthew and John say he gave up his spirit. Mark and Luke say he breathed his last. They do this for what reason? To stress that he died a voluntary death for you and me. Jesus died voluntary. Voluntary in nature was his death. No one took his life. There is no record there. Nobody took his life. Jesus gave his life for others. It was voluntary. When Matthew tells the story of the death of Christ, he mentions the miracles. Remember that experience during that day, Friday? Matthew mentions the miracles that accompanied it. And these miracles teach us the utterly unique nature of our Lord's sacrifice. There has never been a death like this before or since. Because when he died, or almost to die, there were miracles that happened right there on Mount Calvary. I hope you are aware of that. There has never been death, a death that occurred like it or ever since. Now let's look at this. There were five miracles, actually. There were five miracles, and let's see what they teach us about the death of our Lord. I'd like to project that on the screen, the first miracle. Miracle number one. 
What happened? Darkness, what? Falls. According to Matthew 27, verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. It happened suddenly, without any warning. Darkness. One moment, the sun was still overhead. The next moment, it disappeared. Isn't that a miracle? It was never, it was never a, 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 what do you call it, a, a solar eclipse. The sun was overhead one moment, and the next moment, it disappeared. There was darkness. It was darkness itself, thick, inky, black darkness that fell like a shroud over the land. It was darkness without any hint of light. No hint of light. No one moved because it was too dark. No one spoke. For once, even the profane soldiers stopped their swearing. Not a sound broke the dark silence over Skull Hill or Mount Calvary. If there was total silence. Something eerie was going on. The darkness lasted for how many hours? Three long hours. 12.30, still dark. 1.15, still dark. 2.05, well, it was still dark. 2.55, still dark. And then 3 p.m., 3 p.m., just as suddenly as the darkness descended, what happened? It disappeared. That was a miracle. Just as suddenly as the darkness descended, started at 12 o'clock, at 3 o'clock it disappeared. People began to shout. You know, some rub their eyes to adjust to the bright sunlight. And there is panic on many faces, confusion on others. In fact, there was one man that leaned over to his friend and cries out, what is going on here? What is going on here? Friends, it was not an eclipse, a solar eclipse to be specific. Or it was some sort, it was not some sort of suffocating sunstorm that darkened the sky right there in Jerusalem. This was a supernatural miracle of God. It was darkness sent from heaven. Darkness sent from heaven. What does it mean? What does it mean? Well, Jesus' first word from the cross has been, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then his last word was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Remember the seven siete palabras in Spanish? The last word was, my, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then in between those last words and the first words, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In those agonizing moments, my friend, brother and sister, Jesus bore the sins of the world. In fact, Isaiah 53, 4 says, He was smitten by God and afflicted. You can find that in Isaiah 53, verse 4. But no longer. No longer. Jesus dies with the knowledge that the price has been fully paid. He died knowing that the price has been fully paid, the cup emptied, the battle won, and the struggle over. Whatever happened in those mysterious hours of darkness is now past. The familiar words of Isaac Watts, one of those famous composers, describe what this first miracle means. He said, well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when Christ, the mighty maker, died for man the creature's sin. 
Let's go to miracle number two. What's the miracle number two? Verse 51, first part of Matthew 47. Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn into two from top to bottom. That's miracle number two. When Jesus died, the curtain right there was torn from top to bottom. You know, everything about the Jewish temple, everything about Jewish tem uh, worship taught that people should keep their distance. You know, during the olden time, about Jewish temple, people should keep their distance. There's, there were courts set aside for everybody, courts for women and courts for Gentile. That's the Jewish temple. There was a brazen altar right there in the middle of the court for the sacrifice to be made. Then, of course, there were steps leading up to the temple itself. And inside the temple were two main rooms. The first room is what? The most, or the holy place, right? And the second room is called the most holy place. Sometimes called the holy of holy. That's the temple of the Jew. Now, only the priest, only the priest could enter the holy place. And only in a certain way, at certain times, to do certain prescribed religious function. No one ever just hung out there in the holy place. You're going to just hang out there in the holy place, do some chit-chat or talking or giggling. No one over there will hang out. You came to do God's business. And after doing God's business, you leave. It was not a place for lecture. A very important work was being done there, performed by men set apart by God. That's the holy place. But there was yet even more sacred than the holy place. What is that? The most holy place, or the holy of holies. Why it's the most sacred? You know, the heart of Jewish worship took place in that very small area, the most holy place. That's the heart of Jewish worship in the small area. If you read Leviticus chapter 16, you can find the details spelled out about the sanctuary. Leviticus chapter 16. But we can summarize them here this way. Only one man could enter the most holy place. And this is the what? The high priest. Not just the ordinary priest. Only the high priest. He is the only guy who can enter the most holy place. He could only enter the most holy place one day each year. And we call it in the Bible as what? The Day of Atonement. We call it Yom Kippur. Only once a year this high priest will enter the most holy place. And this high priest must wear special garments. He must bring with him the blood of a goat. He must bring with him the blood of a goat, and he must sprinkle the blood on the golden mercy seat. You know that ark there in the most holy place, where you have these two cherubims, one with the other covering? That's the mercy seat over there. He has to sprinkle the blood of the goat right there. Now, if anyone else besides the high priest ever entered the most holy place, he would be struck down. He would be killed. If the high priest entered on any day other than the day of his atonement, he will also be killed. He will be struck down. And if the high priest came without the blood of a goat, he will be struck down. You see how very strict is that? Everything about the system screamed, stay away, stay away, don't come here, don't come here. You are not qualified to come on your own. It was as if the temple itself was a giant roadblock, making sure that no one could come into God's presence uninvited. No one could come into his presence uninvited. If the Jews were tempted to forget about the prohibitions, 
if they decided to take matters into their own hands, God had ordered that a thick curtain be hung between the holy place and the most holy place. You know, <coughs> we human we tend to forget. So Jesus, or God, made it plain that the separation between the holy place and the most holy place should be with a curtain, but it should be a thick curtain, not just any ordinary thin curtain, but a thick, reminding them that they are about to enter the Holy of Holies. So it has to be a thick curtain, thick curtain. Very strict. Now, when Jesus died, this is what happened. Matthew tells us that when he died, the curtain was torn from top to bottom, signifying God had done what only God could do. God had done what only God could do. The law that condemned us has come to an end. Having been put to death in the death of Christ, when Jesus died, the old law died in him. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who believe in Jesus. So the road to heaven is open to anyone, anytime, anywhere. We know that we have eternal life. There is a message for you from the torn curtain in the temple, for all of us. There is this message. Fair, fair enough. The message is this. Don't let your sins keep you away. I know we have sins. We have transgression. In fact, we have this, what you call, darling sins. Don't let those darling sins keep you away. We know that we have this promise and this experience right there on Mount Calvary. God has opened the door to heaven. The cross reveals the great heart of God, and that heart is filled with love. When Jesus died, the Father preached a sermon without words. When he tore the curtain into two from top to bottom, it was God's way of saying, you're welcome in my family. Let nothing keep you away. You're welcome in my family. Let nothing keep you away. Miracle number three. Earthquake shatters. Verse 51, second part. The earthquake and the rocks were split. You know, friends, earthquakes are not good news. I don't know in some of you if there's earthquake. But when there's earthquake and you experience it, it's not good news, right? Especially here in California. There was even a recent article entitled Israel in its hundreds of years overdue for massive earthquake. It discusses the many fault lines found in or near Israel. You know, Israel is in a tough neighborhood, according to this book, jostled between the four tectonic plates. One plate is in Nubia, Africa. The other is in Sinai with Israel. Then you have Arabia and Anatolia, which is Turkey. So Israel is just like surrounded by tectonic plates. That's the science part of that equation. Now, the miracle is in the timing of the earthquake. Look at this. God shook the earth the moment his son died. An earthquake shook Mount Sinai when God gave the law. Remember that? God showed Mount Sinai when the law was given by God in Hebrews 19 to 18. Now there is an earthquake when Christ dies. Why? Signifying the end of the law once and for all. At Mount Sinai, the law condemned, but could not save. At Mount Sinai, the law condemned, but could not save. At Mount Calvary, Christ died that condemned men might be saved. You see the comparison? At Mount Sinai, the law condemned, but could not save. At Mount Calvary, Christ died that condemned men like us might be saved. 
The earthquake at Sinai reminded men that they cannot approach God on their own. The earth shook beneath the cross, as if to say, at last, the curse is being lifted. Romans 8, 22 to 23. What the law could not do, Christ did for us when he died in our place, paying a debt he did not owe. Here's one more thought. Anytime you have an earthquake, business as usual comes to an end. An earthquake stops us in our tracks and reminds us that we are not in control. When an earthquake comes, we run for cover as the earth beneath us begins to give way. Perhaps this earthquake was God's way of saying to a reward reward world. Stop. Stop. Look. Listen. This is my son who died for you. Run to the cross and be saved. Then we have the fourth miracle. Saints race. I hope you read this experience or this story because there were people that were resurrected Verse 52 and 53 of Matthew 27. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. We don't fully understand what happened here. We don't fully understand what happened here. Why was there a resurrection when this experience was uh, happened. Well, this is much, this much is clear. You know, the earthquake split the rocks around Jerusalem that day. The earthquake split the rocks around Jerusalem, opening many tombs. Many of the saints, apparently always, they always refer to believer. You know, you're, you're a believer, you are call, called saint. So many of the saints were raised from the dead Evidently, Matthew means the tombs were opened on Friday, but the saints were raised after Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday morning. What day did the earthquake happen? Friday. And when the earth was the earthquake, it split the rocks. It split the tomb. And people, the dead, the saints, they were, they were like, oh, God. See? But... They were not resurrected until the first day, Sunday. The saints were raised after Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday morning. Christ has to rise first. Christ rose first. Then the saints were raised. And these saints went into the holy city, which means Jerusalem, and gave testimony to the death, destroying life-giving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot say with certainty how many were raised that day, or how long they stayed in Jerusalem, or even what happened to them after that. Well, evidently, it doesn't matter. Or we could have been told these things right there from the gospel. Well, what does it mean? What does it mean? The graves were opened at 3 p.m. on Friday, when Christ died. They remained open for all to see on Friday night and on the Sabbath. It was a sign from heaven that death has been plundered. Now, John Owen <coughs> spoke about the death of death in the death of Christ. The death of death in the death of Christ. Death died when Christ died because he went into the realm of death and came out holding the keys of death and heads in his hand. You can find it in Revelation 1, 18. Now on Easter weekend, we often visit the graves of our loved ones. It's a solemn thing to walk through a cemetery that is serene, that's beautiful, that's quiet, undisturbed. And as we visit our loved ones, we think about how much we miss them. And we wonder where they are now. And if ever we will see them again. From these miracles, brothers and sisters, we have an answer. 
Jesus, or just as these saints rose bodily and presented themselves in Jerusalem, that day will come when our loved ones who knew the Lord will rise again from the grave, free from death, free from disease, free from all corruption, never to die again. Amen to that? Amen. The rising of the saints is a kind of first fruits of the future resurrection of the dead in Christ when Jesus returns. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. It was a small sample. It was just a small sample in one location, Jerusalem, of the coming day when the saints will be raised triumphant and all the graves of all the saints will be empty forevermore. The last miracle, miracle number five, centurion testified. Verse 54, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they were what? They were terrified and said, surely this man was the son of God. This may be the greatest miracle of all. The centurion played a crucial role in the death of Christ. You know, as a leader of a Roman, you know, century, from the word century, centurion, meaning 100 men. He has 100 men under him. He's the general or the leader. He was an officer held in high esteem. He had to be a man of good character. He had to be a man with a proven military record. He knew how to carry out orders promptly. The centurion had to be an expert with a sword and with all other weapons. This means the centurion was, a, was not just any ordinary soldier. No. He was a proven leader of men. And did you know? Did you know? The centurion whose servant was healed. Remember in the record of Luke 7, 1 to 10? That was also centurion. The centurion whose servant was healed is entirely possible because Roman soldiers or officers in a small region like Galilee and Judea would know, no doubt they will cross paths because they were under Rome and they were all officers. If they knew each other, then that centurion or this centurion would already have a favorable impression of Jesus. Certainly he would know that Pilate had three times declared Jesus innocent of any crime. Certainly, he would wonder why he was being crucified. That centurion would wonder why. If he was innocent, and Pilate, he was innocent, Pilate, he was innocent, why was he crucified? He must have heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. He heard him promise heaven to the penitent thief. He witnessed the darkness that fell on the earth. That centurion witnessed that. And he heard Jesus Cry out, it is finished. The centurion heard, heard that. He heard that. Unlike the usual criminals who died in agony and struggle and screaming bitter off, Jesus died quietly as he yielded his spirit to his Father in heaven. Matthew or Mark 15, 39 tells us, Mark 15, 39 tells us, he stood there facing Jesus and so how Jesus died, that centurion. All of that must have made a huge impression on the centurion. And finally, he felt the earthquake that splits the rock into two. That led to his amazing statement of faith. What did he say? Truly, this man was the son of God. Friends, brothers and sisters, here is the answer to the schemes of Caiaphas, the frivolous curiosity of Herod, King Herod, and Pilate's cowardly vacillation. Here is the answer to the towns of the crowd. Here is the answer to the Jewish leaders who wanted him dead. Here, too, is the answer to Judas who betrayed him. They were all wrong about Jesus. They were all wrong about Jesus. The centurion got it right. He somehow saw through the blood and blood and the smell of death that hovered over Golgotha. A Roman soldier, a Roman officer, figured out what the priest 
and the politicians missed altogether. This saw a radical, a mystic, a troublemaker. But the centurion saw the Son of God. Think about these miracles for a moment. Five of them. Jesus touched the sun, and darkness came into the land. Jesus touched the temple, and the veil was turned into two. Jesus touched the earth, and the rocks split apart. Jesus touched the graves, and the saints were raised. Jesus touched the centurion, and he gave a testimony. The first four miracles happened are meant to lead us to the final miracle. That's the greatest miracle of all. Why? Because it's the miracle of a changed heart. It's a miracle of a changed heart. It's a miracle that happens whenever anyone comes to Jesus. It's a miracle that can happen to you at this very moment. What Jesus did for the centurion, of course, he can do it for you. Do you know him? Brother, sister, friend, do you know him? May God give us peace to take our stand with the centurion and say, truly, this man was the son of God. God bless us.